All right, video number two for International Monetary. Let's see if I like where the camera is. I mostly do, good for me. And still going over some sort of definitional stuff here. I wanted to go over um, who the actors were in the foreign currency market. Uh, I said a little bit about this already. Okay, so you got banks and financial institutions are by far, and this is, this is also covered in, I think, chapter two. I don't know where my book is. Um, but uh, banks and financial institutions are by far the biggest participants. We have brokers who act as intermediaries between banks. And what you do is you call a broker uh, to find out where you can get the best price. Um, yeah, I mean, most of this, I don't, I don't want to go into great detail here with stuff that's already in the book. Uh, yeah, all right. Hey, I was done with that. This I'm going to spend a minute on. <clears throat> here are some uh, foreign currency financial instruments. Are right, next futures? Yeah. You have a reading on this too, but I wanted to say a little bit about it uh, just in general. Uh, first, the spot exchange rate is basically the instantaneous exchange rate. Now, it, it actually technically it's like a two-day delivery. So, um, when you go to a bank to buy yen, let's say, you can buy yen spot, you can buy them forward, you can buy them in the future market, you can buy them with a swap, and you can set up an option. Uh, and these, let's see, this one is the instantaneous one. I need yen and I need them today. And then the bank can say, yeah, but we don't have them right here it'll be up to two days delivery time. So two days is kind of the standard. I mean, they, they probably have them uh, right there, but they may have to undertake a transaction uh, with a higher level in the um, wholesaling of currency to get hold of the, of the yen. But this is the immediate price. This is the day's price. As opposed to, I need yen, but I don't need them for 60 days. Or whatever. The, this one, you tell them, it could be, I don't need him, uh, I need him in 18 days. I need him in 43 days. Uh, and what you will do is you will agree on a price today for what you will pay in 60 days or whatever. So on this one here is really a contract that you're setting up with the bank saying that I, I, you know, I'm, I'm receiving a delivery of Nissan trucks uh, and so I will therefore need yen, but I don't need them until, you know, for two months. But I want to lock in a price today because the exchange market is very volatile. And what you don't want to have happen is in between times have, have fluctuations uh, large enough, which are quite possible, to wipe out any of the profits you were going to make on the trucks. So the, the exchange rate fluctuation could also be in your favor. But you're not in the business of speculating in the foreign currency market. You buy and sell trucks. So you go into the bank and say, can we lock in a price today so I know what it's going to be 60 days from now and I can plan around that? So that's what you do. The bank sets you a price uh, for forward yen. I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, there, there's a particular issue I really find very interesting, but we usually don't have time to go into it in class. Anyway, this is very similar, but they're standard contracts. So those are already, put, th these are, um, yeah, for uh, standard contract sizes and maturity dates. So if you say, I need uh, X number of yen in 43 days, or like, well, you can't, you, you got to go to this market, because this market is it sold in chunks of, say, uh, you know, a, a, a million yen at a time. So you can buy a million, two million, three million, but you can't buy, you know, 1.5 million. And they all mature on the same day, all right? So, uh, you know, 30 days from now or, or uh, you know, 60 days or whatever, these are, not by con these are not by contract. These are already, these are derivative. They, these are already created in those chunks. And the reason for this as opposed to this is that these you can't really trade. Uh, if, if you set up a deal to um, buy these yen 60 days from now, then uh, it's difficult to find a well-organized second-hand market for those yen. Whereas if you set it up down here, you can sell off those chunks of yen that you, that you, that you ordered in this second-hand market uh, and with these uh, standard mat maturity dates. And so this is a little bit more for speculation, all right? or it can be used for speculation. If you want to um, 
if you want to speculate in the market for yen, then you can set it up uh, through the futures market. Uh, one of the, let me skip down to this one because it, it fits in nicely with the discussion so far. What if you're that car dealer and you're thinking, well, I, I don't need the yen for two months, but hey, maybe the exchange market will move in a way that's in my favor. So I'm not gonna go ahead and contract to buy the yen. I'm gonna buy an option to buy the yen at a particular price in the future. Right. Uh, so you will go in and, well, uh, you will set up uh, this deal to buy the yen in 60 days at a particular price. And when those 60 days are up, you don't have to exercise the option. You can say, you know what, I'm going to buy them on the spot market. The spot price is better. Uh, I'm not going to exercise the option. Or I'm going to exercise the option. I'm going to buy it at the price we agreed to 60 days ago. Uh, and obviously, you know, you would do whichever one is cheaper. Um, that's not the case here. Once you made the contract for 60 days in the future, you've got to buy it. All right. You're locked into that transaction. Now, you, and, and, you know, likewise down here, even if you don't use the option, you still paid for it. Right. So, so that's kind of the, the, the trade off here um, is that you're paying for the chance to buy at a certain rate in 60 days. And whether you do or not, you still pay for the option, right? And then if you do decide to exercise the option, then you buy those, you end at that price. Uh, so this one, you make the contract and you have to buy the yen at that price in 60 days, regardless of what this price had done, right? It could turn out, you'd be like, oh, oh crap, I shouldn't have gone to the forward market because the, the yen uh, dropped like a rock. And so I could buy those, uh, I could have bought those yen much cheaper if I'd waited till today than if I'd made this contract 60 days ago. Uh, but you know, that's the way it works. I mean, you're, you're, if you're not in business to speculate in foreign currency, then you want to use this and lock it in so that you know what it's going to be in the future and you can plan around it. Um, and uh, yeah, you can use this instead to uh, create an option to do so if you want to, but you don't have to. Then the last one is actually quite popular. Uh, what two parties exchange currencies for a certain length of time and agree to reverse the transaction at a later time. That's the swap. And so a broker will set this up like, um, and you know, nowadays, with these here computer gizmos. Um, you can keep track of all this very quickly. You find out that there's someone in Japan who needs uh, dollars uh, over the next month and someone in the US who needs yen. And so basically what you do for a fee is to set them up to where, why don't you just use my dollars? I'll, we'll just trade right now. I'll give you my dollars, you give me your yen. Uh, and then when we're done, we'll trade it back again. Uh, and um, in, in a sense, what you're doing is you're, uh, what, what you're doing with this market is, you're finding the people in each country who are needing to transact in the other currency for specific periods of time. And you know, if we didn't have computers, obviously that would be very difficult to do, uh, but we do have computers, so it is easier to do. Now, I just looked at a chart, and I believe I assigned it for class. Um, but I just look at the chart. This had been by uh, the most popular, and I believe just recently this, uh, the volume of this outweighed the volume of that. But these two are going to be your big ones. All right. Anything else about that, John? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, I'd already, well, now nah, I've said enough about that. And I do want to say, no, nope, said something about that. All right. Now, um, those are all the introductory things. You've got some other stuff to read uh, as well, but that's as much as I want to do for uh, this. Now, here's the problem with this class. Um, it, it requires intermediate macro first, right? So that's one of the prerequisites. But you might have taken that two years ago. Or you might have taken it last semester, but done really poorly. But, you know, just well enough to get your C minus and, and, and get in here. So I need you to really remember macro right now. Um, the dog needs you to really remember macro right now. And so what I always do in this class is I review macro. So we're going to go back over macroeconomics now. And as you will see, there are going to be some, some key issues here that are going to be related to the... Well, remember I said that currency prices are going to be driven by financial uh, capital flows? Well, we've got to understand financial capital flows. Now, let's see here. This is based on a reading you have to do on... Um, He's probably barking at, the, at, at their neighbor, uh, which he could just go out there. If he goes out there, he'll be want to be he'll want to be petted by the neighbor. But if he's separated from the neighbor, he just wants to bark at the neighbor. Um, okay, weird story. So we, uh, at the grocery store, we got too much chicken. So I'm grilling out chicken, right? 
And so I want to let my neighbor back, uh, back there, TCU graduate, know that, uh, hey, I've got some extra chicken. Do you want the extra chicken? And so I'm looking up to try to find his number uh, and, and, uh, on the internet, and I find out we used to live across from each other in 1987 in an apartment complex that's now next to the Walmart on Hewlett. So here we are next to each other in the 21st century, and we, when Melanie and I first moved to Fort Worth, he was across the parking lot in the, in, in the uh, apartment complex. Stalking is a wonderful thing. Now, let's see. So what I want to do here is then I want to review macro, and I'm going to do so by accessing a PowerPoint that I always use in class. Um, if this is a later non-COVID semester, then you will have noticed in the study questions that I have these little things interjected. PowerPoint, macro lecture from Aspen Wealth Management. That's actually a reminder to me, um, to remind me that I, I, I've done all this background stuff in previous semesters and I'll totally forget I did it. Because I, I do this once a year, this class. I'll totally forget I did it. So if, a couple of years ago, I got the idea of I should include that right in there with basically my lecture notes so that remind me that I have these uh, um, PowerPoints. If you would like the PowerPoint as well, email me to ask for it because I never remember to provide that sort of thing because to me, the PowerPoint's not very useful. I, I, don't, I, I don't see why they would be helpful to you. But, hey, I'm not going to deny you anything just because in my mind, they're not very useful. And here we go. JTH Courses... Uh, I, I rebooted my computer because I started getting this message that my Windows license was almost out of date. And it's, it's a TCU computer. It better not be. Um, so anyway, ah, there it is again. Your Windows license will expire soon. Crap, I don't know what's going on. All right, anyway, let me see if I can pull this other thing up. Um, oh, here it is. Name, lectures and PowerPoints, exam one. There it is. Yeah, macro summary for international monetary. Let me close Discord. That reminder keeps coming up now. I hope this isn't going to be a problem. Here I am trying to get all these videos done. All right. Here is your reminder of how macroeconomics works. And, you know, there's different schools of thought in, in macro, right? So if you had been in my class in intermediate macro, you would have learned post-Keynesian macroeconomics. Uh, and if you weren't in my class, you're about to learn post-Keynesian macroeconomics. And I think one of the most fascinating things to me, fascinating phenomena uh, in the macro economy is the business cycle. And so I like to organize this particular talk around explaining the business cycle. And this is uh, derived from my fascinating lecture to Aspen Wealth Management, which is run by a friend of mine. And she asked me if I would do a talk for them. And I said, sure. So anyway, this is, a, this is the talk I did for them. And so this is sort of for the layperson uh, rather than an economics major. But uh, I'm, I'm hoping that because it's been a while possibly since you've had macro, you will appreciate that I am taking that approach rather than I'm assuming you, you already remember all of macro. All right. So and the first thing I start off talking about here in my exciting presentation is that uh, just as the farmer uh, can do everything right, because this, this was for investors, right? Just as the farmer can do everything right, but if a drought comes along, they're wiped out. And it had nothing to do with their choices as farmers. Sorry, TC, I, I just rebooted it, so it's now telling me about virus protection coming up. Um, just as the farmer can get wiped out through no fault of their own by weather patterns, same thing happens to the entrepreneur when there's a recession. I mean, uh, the financial crisis of 2007-8 uh, caused unemployment that was at the time extremely high. Now it looks awfully good compared to coronavirus unemployment. Uh, but um, there were people who were wiped out who, uh, and, and as the case now, although this is really less of an economic event right now as it is a uh, medical one, um, but wiped out under no fault of their own. They didn't do anything that deserved them going bankrupt. They didn't make any stupid decisions and, uh, and so on. Let me zoom in a little bit further here. Now, then I wanted to show how highly correlated unemployment is to expansions and recessions. Right? 
uh, and the blue areas are recessions. The white areas are expansions. And you don't need to take econometrics to realize that there is an inverse relationship, right? When there is a recession, unemployment shoots up. So when, when GDP is contracting, which is what the recession is going to be, unemployment's going up. When GDP is expanding, unemployment's going down. So the white areas is where GDP is expanding, and the blue areas are where GDP is contracting. Uh, and I put in, a, I tossed in a couple of numbers just to get a sense of what we're talking about there. The height of unemployment after the financial crisis, which is going to be this recession right here, that's going to be the financial crisis. Um, or, or the recession that followed thereafter, uh, the height of the unemployment was 15.2, uh, and not but a year or so earlier, it had been 6.9, so it more than doubled. Uh, and bear in mind, by the way, that when unemployment goes up, uh, the higher unemployment is, the more it tends to understate the magnitude of the problem, because the because all it takes to be employed is that you have done at least an hour's work of paid work during the reference week. That's enough. It's not like the people who are working have 40-hour a week jobs with benefits. Indeed, as you move up here, so the, the, the likelihood that someone has a 40-hour a week job with benefits is going down and uh, going down and down as we move up this way. Um, so. It's a bad thing, and obviously business bankruptcies are, are following the same trend. Now, uh, what I wanted to talk about, too, uh, was the index of leading indicators. Uh, we have an index of leading indicators to try to tell us whether or not a recession is on the way. And uh, it's kind of like, just like with the farmer thing, although this isn't about droughts, it's about tornadoes. A tornado watch means conditions are favorable, a tornado warning means that a uh, tornado has, has already you know, uh, touched down and is liable to kill you. Uh, so what we hope for in economics, of course, is we hope to end up with a watch so that we can, well, th these indicators are supposed to suggest to us conditions are favorable for a recession. Now, you can make two kind of errors there, right? You can either um, report that conditions are favorable, but then there's not one, or not report that conditions are favorable but then there is one. Well, guess what we try to do with tornadoes? We prefer to make the error of predicting one when one doesn't happen than not predicting one and then it does happen. And as a matter of fact, there's actually some history behind that. There was a big tornado in Ohio, I think, uh, northern Ohio, uh, that they, it was right when they were first doing all these uh, uh, NOAA weather radio you know, or, or um, forecast stuff. And they, they kept telling people there might be a tornado and there wasn't one. And they thought, well, you know what, maybe we're getting to where people just aren't paying attention to us. So, so let's not report it unless we're really, really sure there was a horrible tornado that they didn't say the conditions were favorable for. And they said, yeah, let's never make that mistake again. So in economics, um, oh, slide that a bit for you. So in economics, we've got the index of leading indicators. and. Index of Leading Indicators, and as you can see here, uh, one of the most reliable and closely followed indicators of overall economic activity is successfully predicted every recession since 65, but it gave three false alarms. Well, there's the ones where you say, do we want to make an error of, of over-predicting or under-predicting? And we, we aim for over-predicting. We would rather predict one and not have one happen, uh, which obviously has consequences because then it could cause a recession by predicting it. But better than not predicting it and then it happens. And, and that's, um, that's been the case. All right. Well, what is a recession? Well, it's a, a, a sustained decline in total spending. Uh, the rule of thumb, which was made up by, I just, I just learned this. The um, rule of thumb is two consecutive quarterly declines in real GDP. And that was made up by some reporter. So oh, let's just say two consecutive quarterly declines. Because what the National Bureau of Economic Research does, uh, who is actually in charge of, of uh, defining when we've had a recession, is they sit and look at the numbers and make a value judgment. All right? So we, we could go through how they make the value judgment. Uh, but the point is, it's usually pretty close to two consecutive quarters of declines in um real GDP. All right, so in doing this explanation for people, I, I, I think it's kind of nice to, uh, for lay people, kind of nice to go through some actual numbers here uh, and give some sense of what the magnitudes are. And so these are the rounded off values for GDP uh, in 2015. We've got 12 trillion uh, consumption, 3 trillion for investment and for government spending, and the net exports were a negative 0.5 trillion because we had a deficit. And the question that I'm posing here 
is, okay, if a recession, and remember, let me back up to this, recessions suck, all right? And recessions hurt people who had nothing to do with why the recession happened, and sometimes quite deeply. Um, recessions suck. Recessions are, whoops, I went too far. Recessions are a decline in total spending. So which kind of spending falls? Which kind of, is it sort of a combination or, or, or it varies? Or is there one kind of spending that tends to dominate the others in terms of causing recessions? And yes, there is. All right. So that's what we're going to get to. We're going to get to which kind of spending tends to be the one responsible for that pattern that you saw with unemployment over the, um, well, actually, what it's responsible for is the pattern of expansion and recession. So what I'm going to do here is uh, let's simplify the world. Let's, get, let, let's make every Texan's dream come true. Get rid of the government and get rid of foreigners. So now we only have the private sector. Uh, we've only got consumption and investment. Uh, and because, you know, obviously the government could cause a recession by cutting back on spending and, and trade could cause a recession with a, a massive trade deficit. But those are exceedingly unlikely scenarios. Uh, and so let's pull those out and look just at the private sector, uh, the domestic private sector by itself and examine those two. And let's look first at, cons oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and I like to do this if, I, if I'm talking to uh, what I like to call dummies or people who aren't economists like you and me. Um, so, okay, let's think of it this way. Let's think of GDP as water in a bucket, and there's some level of water in the bucket that generates full employment. That's where we want to be. Everybody who wants a job has a job. And now I'm going to ask the question, how do consumption and investment affect the water level? All right. Uh, again, I'm trying to make this not too technical because I'm just trying to remind you guys of some uh, of some key issues because they're going to be really important for the rest of the semester because international monetary is sort of an applied macro uh, area. All right, consumption behavior. How's consumption work? Well, the primary determinant of consumption at the macro level is simply income. The more income people have, the, the more money they spend. Uh, and it's a very, very strong statistical relationship. And you might think to yourself, hey, wait a minute, that, that, um, don't look. Yeah, okay, okay, that's what I thought. I, I didn't know, sometimes I have a second slide after this one that I do not this time, okay. Um, you might think to yourself, hey, that, that's pretty handy. Since income creates spending, and since spending creates income, perhaps, perhaps consumption is something we can depend on to generate high levels of employment and not cause a recession. And unfortunately, that's, well, here's the situation. People like to save money. Uh, and as an economy is wealthier, so net savings goes up. You know, you hear this thing about Americans all save money. Well, that's not entirely true. We, we have, what we have is built-in savings through things like Social Security, through things like uh, um, your retirement plan at work, and net, people save. Uh, and so this, the problem is that let's say we reach the full employment level depending just on consumption. Let's say there's no investment, which of course is ridiculous, but we're starting off here to sort of a, a thought experiment. Say there's no investment whatsoever, there's only consumption. So all we have are, uh, all the restaurants we need are built. We're not building any new ones. That would be investment. We're not building any new ones. The equipment's not wearing out, so it doesn't need to be replaced. Uh, so all we're doing is raising chickens, killing the chickens, plucking the chickens, cutting up the chickens, cooking the chickens, and making fajitas, all right? Uh, so this is gonna be the, um, uh, sorry, Dr. Scott just in political science just texted me and it might be about baseball, which would be really important. Uh, what did he say? Uh, uh, oh, Lord, no. <sighs> I, I have, my, my, my star pitcher is for the Cardinals uh, and um, in our fantasy league. And uh, apparently, this, this is, you may be thinking, oh, yeah, I remember when the Cardinals had that COVID-19 issue. No, it was supposedly over tonight. Uh, and he said that so much for Cards Baseball. Anyway, so I'm panicking right now because I'm invested in the Cardinals and I also lost my closer, uh, but it's okay. I'm gonna go back to you now because you're more important. All right, so let's say we're trying to maintain this full employment level. Let's say we get there. Glory of glories. We get to the con full employment level through just consumption, through just raising chickens, killing them, selling them as, as fajitas, right? Uh, we don't need any new farms, any new factories or anything, so there's no investment. The problem is, that at the full employment, people like to save. People prefer to have uh, money to fall back on. Now, let's see. I got to remember here. Um, data from like 2018. 
I think that people tend to spend like 90% of their income. So, so 10% they save. The 10% they save leaks out. It doesn't get spent, thereby creating more income the next time. Uh, if everyone spent every penny, every period, we could maintain the same level of economic activity over and over. But if they don't, if they put some aside, then the level of economic activity is going to go down. We'll get away from full employment, and eventually we would settle, wouldn't we, below the hole. And that would be a level of GDP so low that everyone needs to spend all their money just to survive, which is not what we're aiming for. We could reach an equilibrium point below the hole, but then it would be, uh, it would be at an equilibrium point where we're unable to save because our incomes are so low. We don't want to be there. We want to be able to be up here where net savings is possible. So, first lesson is that consumption alone is incapable of giving us full employment. Right? Consumption alone is incapable of it. It's not going to be the one responsible for, for fluctuations in it, but by itself it's incapable of maintaining it. Oh yeah, I, I, I don't guess we need this, but I was like, what if this is 20 trillion right here, and what if that's 4 trillion right there, which is roughly the, the numbers we'd be thinking about. Um, and, and so just, just to give some numerical examples. Uh, but, of course, what we could do to maintain, it, now if you had a bucket with a hole in it, and you didn't know how to fix the hole, and you were desperate to keep the level at the same spot, all you got to do is have a spigot, right? Uh, is have a faucet putting water in at the same rate. Uh, at, this, at the same rate as the leakage. This is called an injection in macroeconomics. That's an injection, that's a leakage. Uh, and so we could maintain the same level if we had an injection, and that's what investment is. All right, so now we've introduced that second uh, kind of spending, investment. Investment is a net injection. And if investment, let's see, is that what I got on my next slide? Oh, I, I explain what investment is, that's right. You guys don't need this, but, but idiots do. Um, that the, uh, it's adding the physical capacity, all right? Uh, you, you build another factory, you extend your factory, you replace the fry machine at your restaurant, whatever. All these things are adding the physical capital. That's what investment is. So, if investment were four trillion a time period, in this case, uh, I'm looking at years, then savings could be four trillion and we'd still stay at full employment. All right, we would still stay at full employment if the injection were sufficient to offset the leakage, all right? So, great, and do we reach full employment on occasion? We sure we do. And in, during those periods, the injections are high enough to maintain the same level, even with the leakage. But, poor Melanie. The first time I was putting this talk together, I said, hey Melanie, will you watch my talk? Uh, and she said, no. Uh, and then I said, please, and she said, okay. Uh, so, I'm showing her this talk, right, and we get to this stage, and she says, yeah, but, uh, and I said, I didn't ask for questions from the audience. So I'm giving it anyway. Yeah, but uh, what's to make us think that the firms will invest four trillion every year? Yeah, that's the problem. I said, that's my next slide. Is there any reason to believe that firms are likely to add four trillion a year forever to capacity? And the answer is no. But let's back up for a second. Let's think about this. Um, notice a couple of things about this. Notice that it's really the faucet that's in charge. That when you Increase the uh, spin now, and of course, if we have water spilling up over top of full employment, that's when we're getting inflation. In fact, perhaps, perhaps what I should have done was full employment be the very top of the bucket. That would have been a good way to do this. And then water pouring out of the top would have been inflation, uh, because at that point we're trying to expand the economy beyond its productive capacity, and all we're getting is inflation. But at any rate, in, in any case, uh, notice that this leakage would slow down to the rate of the injection, regardless of what we make the, re the injection. What if we cut it down to two trillion? Well then imagine, if you will, I mean you can do this experiment at home, the water level will go down until the pressure, as you can imagine, the higher the water level here, the faster the water is coming out because the pressure goes up, right? So the, the rate is not always four trillion, it depends on the, on the level. So uh, if we cut this down to two, it'll drift down until the water pressure is such that two trillion is coming out. All right, so uh, if, you, if you cut this back to two trillion, that'll cut back to two trillion. If you turn it off, what will leakages eventually be? They'll be zero. It'll just drift down below the uh, hole in the bucket. So this is in charge. This is the driver of economic activity right up here. So we are worried that they will not add continually to capacity every year.
And why won't they? Why won't they? Well, okay, uh, investment is extremely expensive. Right, it, it, it you know, hey, let's start a restaurant. Well, let's, how much money you got in your pocket? Now, that's not going to happen. Right? You got to go borrow money and um, you know, create a business plan and so forth. Nor do people say, hey, let's start a restaurant for a couple of weeks, see how it works out. If it doesn't work out, we'll just get rid of it. You can do that with a share of stock, but you can't do that with you can do that with a financial investment. You can't do it with a physical investment. Let me get rid of this Dropbox notification here. Thank you. Um, and uh, you can do that with a with a financial investment. You can't with a physical investment. You're pretty much stuck with it. And it's really hard to change a physical investment into something else. We build a restaurant, but let's make it into a car factory. <sighs> it's extremely expensive. So all these factors weigh against firms wanting to invest, people wanting to invest. And, okay, and this is coming from Keynes, by the way. This is post-Keynesian economics, which ironically means it comes from Keynes. And he was actually a mathematician and not an economist. His father was an economist, uh, and his father was an economist at Cambridge, where Alfred Marshall taught, who was a very famous economist at the time. And so Keynes had, you know, fantastic tutors, but he was a mathematician. And something he was fascinated by was the fact that people will make really important decisions without complete information. Now, let me see what my next slide is. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Uh, I may need to move the camera a bit more. All right, so he said that people make decisions in an environment of uncertainty, which he contrasted to what other economists did. Other economists were doing uh, an environment of risk. Risk is when you know all the possible outcomes and you know the odds of every outcome. That's risk. Uncertainty is when you don't know either all the outcomes or, or, or all the odds, right? You, you have insufficient information to make an objective forecast to be able to say that there's an X percent chance of this, an X percent chance of that, an X percent chance of that. And other economists have been doing it in that latter manner because it's easier to model mathematically. And Keynes is like, I don't care if it's easier or not, it's wrong. And he's the mathematician. He said, you are totally missing a key part of the investment process, and this is going to be something important for the rest of the semester in this class, you are totally missing a key part of the investment process, and that is that it takes place in an environment of uncertainty. And that fact makes the investment decision a volatile one, one that causes people to change their minds dramatically from one quarter to the next. And by the way, there is no more unstable factor in GDP than investment spending. By far, it bounces back and forth quarter to quarter. And Keynes is saying, that's because of this right here. They're already scared, and they have insufficient information. Um, and, and let me, ex and, and we'll eventually get to it, and why do people invest at all? We'll get to that in a minute. But let me explain this in some detail, because it's fascinating, and it has an impact on other stuff we're going to do in here. All right. Uh, no, 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 you get the whole screen. Okay, that's the whole screen. Oh, I'm forgetting I can just do this and move it back and forth. I'm an idiot. All right. Uh, all right, so there's, well, I made it worse. Um, all right, this is the new <clears throat> explanation I've come up with for this, and I, and I think it's one that you'll really appreciate as a student. I'd been using some other example, and, and it, it never did quite, uh, but, but this one I like. All right, let's say the TCU Institute's a new policy, that at the end of every semester, you're allowed to go to the registrar's office, plop down $1,000, tell them which class you're focusing on, and then uh, roll a die. And if you roll a one, you get an A in that class. If you roll a two, you get a B. A three, you get a C. A four, you get a D. A five or higher, you get an F. So think about that. I've always thought that this would be an especially big factor in um, the fall semester when all of a sudden you're facing having to go home and, and, and deal with your parents and you failed a class. So like, what if there were an opportunity to go to the registrar's office and say, uh, 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 International Monetary Economics, um, uh, could I roll a die for that one? Why, sure, give me your $1,000. Don't put it on a send home. They'll probably catch you then, your parents. Uh, but you say, sure. So you uh, plop down the $1,000, and then the registrar comes out with... Um, Registrar comes out with, with a, uh, a tray. Now, I've got my dice right here to show you. Let's see. I've got it. I was just doing this example for containing perspectives, so I'm all set for it here. All right. Now, Dr. Quinn and I are really cool people who do things like play role-playing games. So, Dr. Quinn and I 
have really cool things like uh, polyhedra dice. And one thing I didn't plan on, I would like to be able to just set that right here where you can see it. Um, and I'm looking around the room here to find something I can set that on. Uh, I may just have to do this. All right, so let's just do this. And let me turn these up by the number of sides they've got. There's a 10-sided die, 6, 12, and 20. Okay, let me zoom in on that. All right, so let's say, and by the way, a class costs about... I don't know, $4,000 at TCU. So you're failing. You sure as heck don't want to go home and have your parents find out. $1,000 is a pretty good deal, all right? You plop down $1,000, you roll a die, and on a one, two, or three, you've got an A, B, or C. Uh, on a four, you still get a D. So if it's a required econ class, you're still going to have to retake it, but you know, and, and anything high, uh, uh, five or higher is going to be an F. So you walk into the registrar's office, you, you pay the $1,000, and they offer you a tray of dice. You may select any one of these dice. For your $1,000, you can have any one of these dice, but the rules are the same. A one is an A, a two is a B, a three is a C, and a four is a D, and anything higher than that is an F. Which die do you select? Well, the six-sided die. This one has 20 sides, that's why I put the 20 up. This one has 12 sides. This one has 10 sides, so we're gonna count that zero as a 10. Uh, and that one has, as you know, six sides. So you pick the six-sided die. That's got the best odds. You know every possible outcome. You know the odds of every outcome. So you pick the six-sided die. Now, I was doing this uh, same lecture for Containing Perspectives, and I was rolling the six-sided die. My God, all I could roll was five and six, so I kept failing. Uh, it later turned out that there was a little piece of gunk right on the six, which meant that when it tried to roll to the six side, it bounced off of that, which is probably what the registrar's office would do to you. Nah, just kidding. The registrar's office would run a fair game. All right, so let's say you go in there, you've paid your thousand bucks, you've rolled the die, and you roll a five. Well, crap, you've still got an F in that class. Well, but you can do this as many times as you want. Class costs four or $5,000, uh, so you'll have to pay that again next semester, plus, there's the cost of 15 weeks of doing it all over again, plus the cost of telling your parents you failed a class. So, I'm gonna put down another thousand dollars, and I'm gonna pick another die. But which die do you pick this time? The exact same one. Then you roll it again. And I swear I did this the other day, well I told you why. Uh, but oh my God, I failed again. Okay, so I'm gonna pick again. Which die do I pick this time? The six-sided, the six-sided, the six-sided, the six-sided, the six-sided. Notice how decision-making is so stable in this world. Now, the outcomes may not be what you want, but you never change your decision. And so it, it, it creates a picture of a very stable decision-making process and a very stable level of investment. Were it not for outside events, for example, accidentally rolling a five, or not accidentally, but rolling a five or six. But, but, but the, the, the negative outcomes are entirely random, right? And there's no pattern here. Oh, oh, what if, and, okay, A, notice that your decisions are not linked to one another. That what you decide on the first roll has nothing to do with the second roll, has nothing to do with the third roll, has nothing to do with the fourth roll. That there, there is no, the dice have no memory, so you know, it, it just picked the six out of one every time. Plus, let's say you walked into the room right as some moron who doesn't major in economics had rolled the 12-sided die and they had rolled an A. How would that influence you in your choice? Not at all. I'm taking the six-sided die. You got lucky, you moron. Uh, I'm taking the six-sided die. So other people's decisions have no impact on you whatsoever. That is the world of risk, says Keynes. And it is also not the world in which we live, all right? The world in which we live is, let's see, and I'm going through the slides here, uh, but you don't need to see it right now, because I'm gonna show it this way. Uh, the world in which we live is one of uncertainty. And he means something very specific by the word uncertain. He doesn't just mean what we would say in everyday life. I feel uncertain about my uh, grade in international monetary economics. No, he means the inability to create a conclusive argument because you have insufficient information to do so. We have sufficient information here 
Uh oh, where did I set my other two dice? Dang, nabbit. I picked up my other two dice. Oh, here they are. Okay. Um, we have sufficient information here to make a conclusive argument that this should always be your choice. All right. Uncertainty means insufficient information to make a conclusive choice. So, let's say you walk into the registrar's office in the world of uncertainty and you're faced with this. You plop down your thousand dollars and the registrar's office is like, all right, you can either pick one of the dice or you can pick one of the boxes. Those are supposed to be boxes. Um, and we have a die inside that box. And uh, we will roll it. We promise to tell you what we really rolled. And if you want to use that, it's the same die all day long. They put one in in the morning and then they leave it there all day long. Uh, and so, you know, as a consequence, um, if you roll this one three times, we'll still, we'll still keep the same die in there. They're not switching the die out on you every time you pick the, the cap. It's just one particular die. But you don't know what it is. And they're not going to tell you. All right? They're not going to tell you. So what does this world look like? Well, first, Cain says, the information you do have, you'll use. Let's get rid of that one. You're not an idiot. You're not going to use the 20-sided one. You already know there's a superior option to the 20-sided one. So you will never pick the 20-sided one because you use the information you've got rationally. So you eliminate the 20-sided uh, as inferior to the 6-sided. But now what do you do? Uh, and bear in mind, by the way, and I looked this up before I did this lecture, um, there are 200-sided dice. And there are... Let me get one out of here. I just got it out for the lecture that I did for Contending Perspectives yesterday. Here, no, no. Well, there's an eight-sided, but that's still not as good as the uh, six-sided. I was looking for one of my four-sided dice. Um, and there's also... I bet that sounds really good on the, on the microphone. <laughs> I was reaching through my dice there. Um, but uh, there's also... Oh, yeah, I got one, I got one. Here's a four-sided die. All right, there's a four-sided die. Uh, and um, there's also a two-sided die. We also call those coins. So in here, it could be anything from a two-sided coin, uh, a two-sided die, to a 200-sided die. All right, so there are superior options to this. In fact, if you take the, if you take the four-sided, man, oh, man, uh, you're going to pass regardless. It might be with a D, but you're going to pass regardless. And the two-sided, of course, you're, you're with an A or a B. Um, okay, here's the deal. All right, let's get rid of those. I would guess that people would tend to choose the six-sided first, although it might be a more interesting experiment if I'd left an eight-sided out there first. That would be a tough one, wouldn't it? Because you'd know uh, that there's a, a you know, because at least with a six-sided die, you've got a 50-50 chance of getting an A, B, or C. Uh, here's an eight-sided. Well, let's do it with an eight-sided instead of the six-sided. Still superior to the 20-sided. So you still want this over the 20-sided, but now you're like, well, crap. Um, and I, I feel like, again, I don't have a way to back this up, that initially people would pick the one they could see. All right, so you roll it. You got a six. Crap. You roll it again, pay another thousand dollars. You get, you got a seven. Are you now tempted to pick one of the other dice? You might not. You might not. But the point is that in this world, you are tempted to do something you never chose to do in the previous world, and that was change your mind. You never changed your mind in the first world. You always picked the six-sided die forever because you were able to make a conclusive argument. Now the world is scary. Now you're not sure if you're making the right choice or not. And so you might change your plan. You might decide, you know what? Let's go with a pen cap. Or check this out. As you were coming into the room, some other kid rolled this one and they got an A. Would that affect your choice? Oh my God, yes. Now you're, now you're copying other people's behavior in a way that really happens in the financial market. All right? uh, now we're getting bandwagons. Now we're getting booms and busts. Uh, you're copying because that person succeeded. And you know, when before, before when the dumb kid came in, and I can't remember what I did now. Maybe I did the 20-sided die. And the dumb kid got... I did. The dumb kid got lucky and rolled a one. You're like, yeah, good for you. I'm picking the six-sided die. Now, you're thinking, well, shoot. Maybe I ought to pick that one. That other kid got an A. Uh, and so, 
That's the situation that uncertainty creates. All right, uncertainty creates a situation in which people's people can panic. People can change their minds rapidly and decide, you know what? Let's get the hell out of this market. Let me go back up to the screen now. Back up. Okay. Um, uncertain with an uncertain endeavor. Uh, now the choice is no longer straightforward. Past outcomes, and other choices will weigh on you. And you will alter your decision over time. You won't do the exact same thing over and over. Let's go back to this one, which I had not shown you. The choice is clear and unaffected by past outcomes or other selections. You will never alter your decision. You always pick the six-sided die, period. Cain says, that's wonderful, except that's not how the real world works. Now, it turns out that's easier to model mathematically, which made it attractive to economists. But he was like, look, at some point you got to decide, I worry, I'm worried more about explaining the real world than I am about making a pretty model. Um, and so, and in fact, he had uh, statements to that effect uh, directly saying that. So, let's see, add to the other uh, not forecasting. Oh, yeah, 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 I got to mention that to you as well. Okay, here's an, here's an additional complication in the financial market. We are not forecasting the outcome of an event that is totally out of our control, like we are with this. You know, if we were a, if we were all sitting around forecasting this, then uh, none of us would have any power over what the die actually did. On the other hand, if we're the U.S. stock market, we're all the participants of the U.S. stock market, our forecasts cause the outcomes. Our forecasts create the prices. What a complicated situation we've got now. And so now, not only am I worried about the fact that I don't have sufficient information to make a... Uh, a, a conclusive argument, but now I'm really worried about what everybody else is thinking, because what everybody else is thinking is going to drive the price, because we create the price. Great stuff. Now, why do we invest at all then? Why does it, you know, going back away from the uh, financial market and back to physical investment, sorry, drinking water, why would we invest at all? And Keynes said, uh, spontaneous optimism, or as he called it, animal spirits. People say to themselves, you know what, but I'm different. Sure, 75% of all businesses fail within the first four years, but not mine, because I'm special, which you try to explain to the loan officer collecting on the debt a couple of years later when you've gone bankrupt. Uh, so, which is great. You know, I mean, it, 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 it's a positive thing that us homo sapiens believe that in general, we have a tendency towards we can do it. We'll figure it out, all right? Otherwise, I, don't, I assume that most species have that same feeling, otherwise they would just sit around and die. I don't know, I guess I could go kill an elk, but it sounds like a lot of work. Probably won't find one anyway. Nah, go kill an elk. So, the overall investment level is this constant battle between the fact that investment is expensive, a long-term commitment, practically irreversible, and we have this uncertainty stuff with this very subjective forecast we make, versus, screw it, I can do it. Uh, and that's why it is so unstable. That's why you have that investment spigot there, turning up high, turning up low, uh, on and on, you know, over time. Um, and remember, the spigot at the top is driving the spigot down, or is driving the leak down the bottom. Now, you may have heard at some point of an economic theory called loanable funds, where these funds down here create the investment funding. Uh, I don't have time to explain that right now. We will later. Uh, I think, I can't remember in this class if we do or not. Yeah, 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 we do, we do. Um, that's not the way the financial market works. All right? uh, banks and financial institutions are able to create money out of nothing. They don't need your savings, but that's, that's for another day. But every once in a while, I have a student say, well, but wait a minute, won't this create that? And no, it doesn't, because that theory is wrong. All right, All right. let's see here. Uh, oh, okay, so now here's how expansions die, all right? So I wanna, I wanna show you four stages of the business cycle. Here's the recession, and here it is over here, so we're kind of linked together. Here's the recession, early expansion, mid-expansion, late expansion, and I want to show you the important role of that uncertainty in there. Okay, in early expansion, I'll say, what, do I have another slide on this, or am I just going to talk about it? I'm just going to talk about it. All right, uh, in early expansion, what tends to happen is this. Everyone is still kind of depressed. See? Everyone's pessimistic. But they will discover 
that actual sales and profits are rising. Indeed, statistically, the first year of an expansion is the biggest percentage change increase in profit over any other part of the, uh, of the business cycle, which makes kind of sense, doesn't it? Because, I mean, profits really sucked over here. Now they're going up. So any improvement is a big percentage change, but nevertheless, it comes as a surprise. People are like, oh wow, this is great. And it's like you're rolling that unseen die in the, in the, in the registrar's office and people are hitting ones and twos. Like, all right, man, this is, everything's great. So now you're becoming more optimistic in this second period. The uh, balance between the animal spirits and all those negative factors was really in favor of the negative factors here until you kept making high profits. You're like, well, I guess it's time to start investing again. <clears throat> Through here, we have optimistic expectations and we have high profits, uh, decent sales. But here's how it dies. And the fact that the economy does this, again, is really important to international economics. Okay, investment is going to fall. Through every expansion since World War II, except one, which was uh, around the time of the Vietnam War and there was apparently some secret government spending going on, um, in every expansion except one, in, uh, investment spending has, has outright declined, or at least decelerated, in every expansion but one right before the recession. Even before coronavirus, investment was already coming down. Uh, I am on record in Forbes saying I think there's about to be a recession because we just had three consecutive quarterly declines in physical investment spending. Why does it do that after a long expansion? Is it because people get depressed? No. People are actually still very optimistic, and that's the problem. They're still very optimistic in that last year of the expansion, but profits start to fall because sales are falling, because investment is falling. When investment goes down, you're laying off construction workers, you're no longer buying lumber and bricks and, and, and whatever else it is that you need for your firm. So uh, when you're cutting back on investment for yourself, which is a good thing, because investment is expensive. And you don't make any money investing. You only make money when you open the doors of your new restaurant or whatever it is. Then you make your money. So you're excited when you open those doors. You're not depressed, but you've stopped investing. And when this starts to accumulate, across the economy, when a number of different firms are all at that same stage, all of a sudden it has a, a, a macroeconomic impact, and indeed, rates of profit decline at the end, uh, in the last years of expansions. Of course they do during recessions, but I mean during the expansion, rates of profit decline. So, why? Why does the investment fall? Well, we only need so many restaurants, so new building is going to slow as time passes. Uh, and um, going back to this right here, we're building lots and lots of new restaurants in here, but we're not going to build restaurants forever. I mean, in fact, we don't want to because building a restaurant is expensive and it's a, it, it doesn't make money until we open the doors. And so we have a target number we want to build. We build them and we stop. But when you stop, investment falls. And you're taking on a great deal of debt. And so you're eager to stop building and start selling. But that means that people's forecasts are disappointed. Because investment is falling, sales are falling. And also, uh, projects coming online in late expansion are going to face more competition. So your forecast for profit is not going to be what you thought it was. Uh, and going back here again, you had these really high expectations going into this last period. So the expectations are still going to say optimistic, but the actual sales are going to say falling. I think that's what I put in there, or low, whatever I put in there. Um, and so, uh, yeah, panic. I told the board if we open new, 10 new franchises, they'd earn an average of 7%. The first five are done, but only averaging five. Stop. Don't even do the other two. All right? Stop right where we are. And, and this points out something, by the way, that Keynes says in the general theory. He says that during this late period of the expansion, they might have been all excited about 5% way back in early expansion, but they were expecting 7%. So the problem is not that firms overbuild. The problem is that firms build with expectations that are bound to be disappointed. Because in this last period, yeah, I did use falling, uh, that we're slowing down, we're already slowing down spending anyway, so that was going to cause the economy to, to, uh, to at least um, decelerate. But now we, we hit the brakes on investment. Uh, we hit the brakes big time during this period right here, uh, projects that we might have continued had we had different expectations to start with, um, we stop. And let me see here if I've got... 
Oh, uh, and Keynes then says, the error of optimism is replaced by an error of pessimism. What I want to show you now is some actual data on that, and I don't remember if I put some in here. I did, but I, I want to use um, some more recent data. So, let me go here. Uh, let me go to the what they call the Internet. And new GDP figures just came out along with um, new... Uh, Let's see. Federal Reserve. Yeah, that'll work. That'll work. GDP. Oh, no, no. I'm an investment. Gross. Private. There it is. Domestic investment. I, as I'm sure like you, subscribe to the Federal Reserve Bank of um, St. Louis updates on various economic statistics. And there is investment over time. The shaded areas are recessions. So, let me show you. I'll shrink it down a little bit so it's easier to see specific recessions. Uh, let's start here. And let's, in fact, pull this back in a bit, too. Okay. Here was the long expansion um, through the 90s. This was the big, long expansion we had in the 90s. And notice that investment is fizzling out right here. It recovered a quarter, these are quarters, recovered a quarter, but then it dropped. It went up a little bit there in the last part, but as you can see here, net investment is falling, all right, through that period right here. If I were willing to write on my, on my uh, screen, I could draw a little downward line there. And then it really decelerates during the recession, all right? Then they really cut way back. Um, then let me slide to the next recession. And this one here, uh, it, it's hard to see here, but there's a downturn right before this one, too. Um, and there's actually been a downturn back here as well. So net, we're having, although it's pretty flat on this one here, but the last one is, is down. Um, let me go to the financial crisis. Yeah, there's the financial crisis. This one here is the financial crisis right there. Look at what investment's doing actually for over a year. In fact, uh, those of us post-Keynesian economists it really expected the recession earlier. Um, and, and in fact, it was an unusual thing here that this is when, and of course, it's going to make perfect sense to you now in the context of the financial crisis, there was a great deal of loaning to households going on. Consumption actually did something it usually doesn't do, and that is maintain the expansion a little longer. So despite the fall in investment, consumption was able to keep the, investment, the, the, the expansion going, but then of course it also built up a massive amount of debt. And eventually, as you can see here with this downward slope, firms stopped investing. Um, and and they, they, you know, profits went down, and then you have this really steep decline afterwards. And let me show you our most recent one, <clears throat> which will be equally depressing. Oh, no, no, there he goes. Cool. All right, so here's the gap between the recession at the, uh, the, the financial crisis, then this wonderful period where you wish you would graduate from college down here so you could have got a good job, but instead you're going to graduate out here. Um, as you can see here, investment was already falling. It recovered and then fell, fell, and then we have this massive collapse here in the middle of the recession caused. This one was, of course, a uh, human, well, I shouldn't say human-made, virus-made uh, recession here, but it was already on its way down. So, that's the argument about investment spending being such a key factor and, unfortunately, extremely unstable. <clears throat> now, let's see. Uh, what do I want to do next? I'm going to tidy this one up here. This has been about an hour. Um, yeah, okay, okay, let's do it this way. All right. Shift F5. Okay. So, uh, for the talk I was giving, I did show uh, what was going on at the time. Uh, and as you can see there, it looked like it was coming down. But we don't need to look at that because we've seen much more. Here's a funny joke. Ha ha from the onion. And, all right. So, what do we do about this? Let me back up to the bucket. What do we do about this? If that's unstable, <clears throat> how are we going to fix it? Well, the post-Keynesian view and the neoclassical Keynesian view uh, is that the government can do that. When the spigot, <clears throat> we just need a second spigot. When the spigot gets turned down here, then we have the other spigot that gets turned on, right? Uh, and 
If this were an intermediate macro, I would go into great detail about how they figure out when to turn on the spigot and when not to turn it on, which is related to directly to unemployment rates. But I'm not going to do that in this class because that's not my goal. Uh, so government spending. Uh, but I do want to mention this, and that is that uh, uh, with the government spending, um, you know, well, but if we keep doing that forever, then we'll um, bankrupt ourselves. It is impossible for the United States of America to default on debt in dollars. It is not possible. Here's the Federal Reserve Bank of, da uh, of, of St. Louis pointing it out. Here is the former chair of the um, uh, Federal Reserve. Uh, these are some uh, private sector in investment analysts. <clears throat> I've got a bunch of these. Here's the chair of the Fed again. Uh, here's the chair of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, who was in charge of that uh, during World War II. Um, here's some guy named Ronald Reagan, Dick Cheney, on and on and on. Uh, it's not possible for the U.S. to default and debt its own currency. What currency was Greek debt default uh, denominated in? <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> oh my God, coronavirus. Um, it was euros. It's not their money. The Mexican financial crisis. They owed money in foreign currency. That really sucks. Uh, and so. I mean, if it's your own currency, you can't, go, you can't go bankrupt. So now, there's a lot more to say about that, but this isn't macro class. Uh, so I think I'll leave it there and I'll stop this video. Uh, and there's something else I want to show you next. Uh, well, obviously, you're a moron. Of course, there's something else you want to show you next. All right, then stop the video.